So maybe we are extravagant. Maybe we are extravagant. Maybe we are extravagant. We're pretty extravagant here. <laughs> <Our> electricity use. <laughs> So our electrical needs on this boat aren't huge from like a cruiser's standpoint. They're high compared to other boats this size, um, mostly because we have a freezer and a fridge. But beyond that, we have the basic stuff that you got on a boat. We got some lights, we got some fans, we got TV, I guess is a luxury. That's about it, really. We have a lot of camera gear that requires a lot of charging and yeah. laptops and stuff. So that adds a lot. So maybe we are extravagant. Maybe we are extravagant. Maybe we are extravagant. We're pretty extravagant here. <laughs> <Our> electricity use. <laughs> Let's break this into three parts. How we make the electricity, how we store it, and then how we use it. And we use it. First of all, we got three ways we charge the batteries. We have 600 watts of solar, which is, we got a card for that up there if you want to watch that video. And then we have a um, system to charge off of the engine. And then lastly, we have a small battery charger that runs off 120 volts that plugs into a extension cord and eventually a dock or something like that. We do not have a generator. We do not have a huge high output alternator. We we pretty much just have those basic things. We have, we have a true solar, a true uh, have, no, shore power system. And we don't even have like a real shore power system at all. So the 600 watts of solar panels connects to three separate um, Victron, 15 amp Victron charge controllers. Um, we have three separate ones because our uh, we have a system of sliding panels, which um, shadows one of them when it's not in use. So you don't want those to share a charge controller because you would lose performance. And then lastly, we have two flexible panels that are all that share a charge controller. So like different types and different brands of uh, solar panels, while you can technically mix them, it's best to have them run with their own charge controller. And the, and the way that a lot of these things are priced, one 600 watt charge controller is almost the exact same price as three 200 watts ones. So it doesn't make any sense to get some big one and so but also you have some redundancy too so the engine is kind of self-contained so it's got its own battery it's got its own specific electrical system and gauges and pumps and things like that and it has its own alternator so it's the alternator connected to the engine only charges the battery that's connected to the engine so to charge our main house bank from that we have a battery to battery charger so it pulls power from the engine battery and alternator and pumps it into the house batteries. So that's a 30 amp device we have there. So when we're running a motor rink, we can charge our house batteries at 30 amps. Does that system ever go the other direction? That system never goes the other direction. Do you need a battery combiner or uncombiner? No. So this kind of, this kind of takes a, this battery to battery charger is kind of like the newer version of battery combiner. It's, it connects the batteries together and allows you to charge them together, but it does it with a little bit more sense and smarts because it allows you to charge your house bank with a slightly different voltage and charging rate than your starting bank. Because typically the alternators that come on engines are dumb and they just put out a constant voltage and that doesn't always get your house bank completely topped up. When we talk about the batteries, you'll, it'll be more clear of why we did this. And, um, these devices are recommended when you have different battery chemistries between your start bank and your house bank, as we do. <laughs> and the last item we have for charging the batteries is a 15 amp battery charger connected to the house bank. So that just plugs, since we, and we don't have any shore power connection or anything like that. So if we go to a marina for a couple nights or something like that, we have literally an extension cord that we plug into the power post and then plugs in directly to the battery charger. That's the charging side. We've got the solar, we've got the battery charger, and we got the engine. Now we're moving on to the batteries. This is my most exciting part. And the most expensive part. <laughs> These 300 amp hours of lithium iron phosphate batteries. Lithium iron phosphate is the one of the safest lithium um, chemistries. 
much safer than what you see on your cell phone or anything like that. It, it's not as lightweight and not as compact as like a cell phone battery, but the performance has longer performance and is much safer. So you give up a little bit of size and a little bit of capacity for a certain weight and volume, but the trade-off is safer and it lasts a hell of a lot longer. So the advantage of why we went with these batteries is that you can run them down to 20% without any damage. So you can use 80% of the capacity of the battery. With like a standard lead acid battery, you can only use like 30 to 40% of the battery before you start to damage it because of the low voltages. And with an AGM, you can run it, really run it down to like 50% before you start to damage it. So like this is equivalent to like a 900 amp hour AGM. Lead acid and a 600 amp hour AGM bank. Two, two other things that are nice about them is they weigh about one third the weight of an AGM battery. And if you're living aboard a small boat like us, you know your, your water line starts to sag a little bit after a while with all the stuff you put on it. So losing a couple hundred pounds on batteries is always nice. The, then the final point is that they have a cycle life of 5,000 to 7,000 cycles. Two eighty, two down to twenty percent. So that's um, so lead acid battery is probably good for five hundred cycles. So ten times the life of a traditional traditional battery. Up to technically over the long run they are cheaper, but there's a lot of upfront cost when switching to lithium. And that brings us to why we want with the, some of those uh, Victron chargers is because we could configure them for the voltages that the lithium ion batteries like, um, especially the engine. It charges its starting battery at a completely different voltage than what the lithium ion batteries like to see. It was also really cool because with the solar charge controllers, we actually started with AGMs with the solar yeah. and then we switched to the lithiums and we didn't have to change charge controllers. Andy literally went into the app and like made like one button change and like, ta-da, everything was fine. Right. It was pretty cool. And they all like Bluetooth talk to each other. So I just like literally made one preset and loaded that into all the charge controllers. Yep. So that was that was pretty straightforward. So that was that's the heart of our system is the three Battleborn 100 amp hour batteries, which we mounted in a cockpit locker, which freed up some space below the floor here. And that's also kind of damp down there quite a bit. So keeping them in the cockpit locker keeps them drier, amazingly. <laughs> Only on this boat. Only on a boat like this. <laughs> keeps them drier. The final thing is what we use the battery power for. And we don't have a shore power connection on this boat. Um, everything we have is either 12 volt or runs off of a 2000 watt inverter. Starting with the inverter, it's a 2000 watt inverter tied into the batteries and all of our outlets around the boat are directly wired into it. None of the outlets are hooked to a shore power and they cannot be connected to land at any point. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, if you go to a foreign port, it's, the voltage is different, so it doesn't matter anyway, you can't connect it. And then the second thing is a lot of the marinas I've noticed are either wired improperly or like the voltage is pretty low and that um, can damage some things. So by running everything out of inverter, you know the voltages is right, you know the wiring's correct, and you don't have anything to worry about, especially when you're charging expensive laptops and things like that. It was, it was a safety thing for us to do it that way. And it also simplifies things a lot because we don't have a shore power cord. Which is a space saver because shore power cords are huge. They yes. take up so much space. By the time you install like a 30 amp shore power cord, you got like a, a separate panel, you got breakers, and you got all this stuff that you don't need if you wire it directly into your inverter. Before everyone freaks out, there is internal circuit protection in the inverter. So there's no fire danger or anything like that by not having any fuses because it's internally protected in the inverter. So the things that run off the inverter are laptops, camera gear, and shop vacs, tools, things like that. Anything you plug in, like with a regular household plug. And yeah, anything with a household plug, so our, our tea kettle, Instapot, food processor, that sort of thing, this all runs off of the inverter. 
fridge and freezer and run on 12 volt because it's more efficient to do it that way. Um, the bilge pumps, lights, and all the navigational instruments because they're all marine boat stuff, so they run on 12 volts normally. Our TV runs off 12 volts, but I haven't wired that in yet. But so we run that off 120 volts. So 12 to 120, then back to 12. <laughs> um, so my list of projects to do. We have a battery monitor, which is like a, like a pretty much like a fuel gauge for the batteries. It tells you how full they are, what if, if it's being charged by, by something or if it's being discharged. And then we have a couple of apps, our status of our charge controllers, our battery to battery charger and the, and our shore power charger if it was plugged in. And then we can also monitor our battery level as well. So I can, don't have to leave bed and I can see how full the batteries are. Which you love to do. That's how you start your morning every morning. Yes. How low did we get overnight? Coming down from Vermont, we've been using about 30% of our capacity per day, right? Yeah. So about a hundred amp hours per day. I think it's less than that. I think it's less than that too, but not by much. I think it's around 60. I don't know. We should really track it more. Yeah, we should track that more and get back to you on that. <laughs> but I think it's between like 60 and 70 amp hours per day. We did make some improvements to the fridge with our icebox reno, uh, notably sealing it. <laughs> so there's not like a four inch hole in the back. <laughs> and a paper towel stuffed in it. <laughs> with like a chunk with paper towel stuffed in it. So it's actually filled with expanding foam now. Yeah, our fridge is the single largest user of power on this whole boat. Yeah. yeah. I, typically that's what you would, if you don't have air, next to air conditioning, which we don't have, a fridge is like the number one user of power on a boat. Our Ingle freezer uses less power than our icebox fridge unit does. Yeah. One of the things we've done for efficiency, we changed to a lot of LED lights. Mm -hmm. um, we still haven't changed these over because I haven't found one I like that fit in here. This one you go like... Of oh, course, it's going to show. Of course, it's going to work perfectly now. But typically, you got to like wiggle it. There it goes. <laughs> you got to like wiggle it just. Because <laughs> that's safe. Just right to get it to go. So these are still incandescent, but pretty much everything else is LED with exception of the navigation lights. Mm -hmm. On the usage side, there's a little bit of distribution. So we got a couple of um, breaker panels and we got a couple of bus fused bus bars to feed them. Um, mostly making sure that everything has overcurrent protection. So if something were to short out that a fuse or a circuit breaker would trip, rather than having overcurrent through that wire and eventually heating up and possibly causing a fire. And fires on boats are a very bad thing. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, leave a, leave a comment down below and we'd love to hear from you.